Hello and welcome back to the Schooner Pod. I'm your host, Bobby Howard. With me today, he's back, Jameson Maxwell. And Jameson, let's hit the damn music. It's damn a right. it's been a day. Jamison. Yes. What is this? The- Jamison. This is a fruited corner with Jamison. Everybody dancing. Oh, that's nice. Man, that that hit. I needed that. I got shivers all the way down into my toes after seeing that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it it is very nice. He's right. That is very nice. What happened? Um, so National Signing Day Part One was yesterday. Pretty uneventful. Everyone, you know, signed where they went, and then uh, two major pieces that it, we thought would get go to OU didn't go to OU with uh, Aku, uh, Akana and then um, uh, Peyton Bowen. But wait. Today, out of nowhere, uh, you know, I mean, there was some rumblings, but it finally happened. Peyton Bowen flips after committing to Oregon, after flipping from Notre Dame to the Sooners uh, in, in what is truly one of the wildest uh, recruiting sagas I've ever seen. Jameson, just you take it away. How do you even begin to describe what the hell just happened? Man, did Sooner fans need this? Obviously, we as a football team are going to be getting an amazing athlete as safety in Peyton Bowen. But man, did Sooner fans for the mental health need this? Because what David Hicks did to us last second, whenever we thought we had him in the bag before he committed to, tex- committed to Texas a and And then, you know, to Celia Kana also kind of, you know, like being OU, 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 then Texas swooping in at the last second. It just seems like we just keep on getting buzzer beat at the end of the game and every single game we're playing. And it's just, golly, it is just getting taxing. It was at this point where, like, I felt pain. And I, I saw your tweets, Bobby. You were feeling pain, but it's like, man, I just, I'm almost used to it at this point. So thank goodness one thing went our way here and we could flip them at the last second. Well, I mean, and it's been going on like this for years. You know, we've seen it going back to like Kamar Wheaton, you know, just uh, Jace McClellan. It, oh it just it kept kept hitting over and over again. And my thing is at least my thing with with Bowen was that I'm like, well, at least he never was actually committed, you know, so yeah. it, it hurt a little bit less. But it was nice to be on the other end of uh, some, you know, last second hijinks for once it was so yeah. nice he wasn't publicly committed but you know brent venables at the time of this like whole saga going on um with the hats he was talking about how they had you know 25 people in the class and they had was it six dbs and everything and everyone's doing the math they're like that means that the one commit that we're gonna get today that we don't already have is a db and really the only guy that we could actually get is peyton Bowen. so I think Brent Venables wouldn't be saying that out loud if he didn't already have a commit to him that wasn't public already from Peyton Bowen. So it was an absolute last second change. And, you know, Peyton Bowen went out and said it was a last second change. It was like a knee jerk reaction. We know, we all know that Peyton Bowen's mom loved Marcus Freeman, loved Notre Dame, loved the thought of that. But, you know, Peyton didn't really want to go to Notre Dame. You could tell he, like, in his, you know, his uh, message, in his edit, he was finding, you know, ways, you know, obviously to find something different from Oklahoma. And it wasn't Notre Dame. It really, he was not falling in love. It just seemed like he was looking for something else other than Notre Dame and Oklahoma. Maybe it might have been Oregon. His dad allegedly liked Oregon. And obviously with their NIL package, who's not going to love that? Um, but all things considered, you just couldn't take him away from what he wanted. He might have made the decision that might have appeased his parents first, picking Oregon or picking Notre Dame as one of the two options. And maybe his parents didn't have OU as number one, but I bet you OU is like number two on both of the parents' lists. And he's an 18-year-old who's making millions of dollars now. He be he should be able to make his own decision. I think he came to terms with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I his his letter, I thought, you know, well, I, I think the way he handled his decision really turned a lot of people off. I feel like the way he described it and the way he kind of apologized for, you know, the way he handled it, I thought was very, you know, illuminating, very. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe I'm just making maybe I'm just making excuses because he's a sooner now. But I feel like it was very, you know, kind of mature to be like, hey, I'm sorry for anything I did to hurt anyone. This is just how I went, because. You could tell it was really weighing on that family as a whole. Obviously, his girlfriend is in Norman. 
Um, his mom clearly wanted him to go to Notre Dame, uh, just mm. by the whole wave of emotions. That was some good her. acting. It was either she knew it and she I don't was think playing she did. the part, but it, I've seen like you know many of these announcements where the parents don't know it and they get mad. What was that? That one was like where I think like Emmett Smith <laughs> got mad about the Florida. Um, whenever they didn't commit to Florida, his son. So like we've seen him before, but she she looked genuine. Yeah, I mean, because she was genuinely excited when he picked up the Notre Dame hat and then instant crushed when uh, he picked up that pink little Oregon hat. You know, it, you could tell. You could see the exact moment her heart broke. Like if you went yeah. to the films yeah. all bit by bit. <laughs> that pink Oregon hat was pretty cool. But I mean, like, it makes me think, like, wouldn't he have picked more of an, a bigger Oregon logo if this was a thing that he was thinking about doing ahead of time? That just kind of looks like a cool hat he got gifted. And he's like, oh, I'm probably picking Oregon. I better go get this one that, you know, the coaching staff gave me on my one unofficial visit. He took one unofficial visit there, canceled his official. Like, that was just so funky. I, I don't know about you, Bobby, but whenever he picked up the Notre Dame hat, I still felt good. I wasn't worried about it. I was like, oh, this is classic. OU's hat is not even on the table. It's under the table. You know, it could be under the helmet. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere. Uh, it's somewhere hiding. And since OU wasn't even on the table, it made me feel so much better. And he picked up the Notre Dame hat. I'm like, I'm not scared. Now that's that's all part of the play. And it was part of the play. Whenever he picked up the Oregon hat, I'm like, we're great. You know, he just put down Notre Dame. That's our biggest competition. Oregon's not really, it's been kind of an afterthought this whole time. And then he goes, Sko Ducks. And I'm like, is this part of the act still? Like, what's going on here? What, where's the OU hat? I didn't believe it for like a solid like five or ten minutes. I I was astonished. I didn't even realize it was an Oregon hat until he started talking about Oregon. Because like people in the comments are saying it was, it was pink. It was not green. It was the least Oregon, Oregon hat uh, you possibly could have had. And um as you as you mentioned, it, it came out of nowhere. You know, only one visit. It was unofficial, um, and just it just really felt random um, because you know it was a battle between OU and Notre Dame. That's all we all we kept hearing over and over again. And them coming in at the last minute, I feel like that was the first kind of big shock. Uh, Oregon kind of hit yesterday um, mm -hmm. in a line of just many, many, many hits. Um, yeah. They. Dan Lanning went nuts uh, yesterday, for sure. Phil Knight went nuts. Yeah, Phil Knight, yeah. What, whoever is running the, the Ducks bagmen, um, that, geez, it was crazy. It was, it was truly crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, look, I think, I think you got to say, you got to give it up to Brent Venables and that recruiting staff, Jay Valai as well, Valet. Um, Absolutely killed it. Just on real closing. It. How do you, I, I've never seen anything like it. You know, um, usually the saying is you never know until pen is to paper. Really? I, I guess that I could say you never know until the paper is in the fax machine and getting sent right. to that school. Or like the email is sent me, you know, like docu signs and all these things that they're doing nowadays with these contracts. Like he wrote that he signed during the, you know, his announcement. Like I watched the pen go to the paper and that's when I was like, are you kidding me? Like this dude is actually signing Oregon. And we don't know these things, you know, as fans, like, did he send email? Did he press send? Did he actually send in the documents? And we didn't know for a couple hours. And then hope started to really come in in the evening. And we're like, oh, he hasn't signed yet. And people are starting to push. And obviously a lot of Sooner fans, we like to go down rabbit holes. I'm like, oh, he didn't, he didn't sign yet. It's almost like the flight tracker of like, in, like <laughs> in I, NLIs. Gosh, it's so hard with yeah. NILs nowadays. You know, like checking to see if the email got sent. Um, and I still didn't believe it. Even after it's like, oh, he hadn't sent it in yet. And I was like, eh, I mean, it's eventually going to get sent in. I'm sure we're giving him the full court press. But, I mean, he made his decision. But unbelievable job from Jay Vlay and, you know, Brent Venables waking, you know, going all throughout the night, you know, making sure that they could seal the deal not taking no for an answer. They knew that they had a special bond with Peyton Bowen and they weren't just going to let that go. Just do a knee jerk reaction in Oregon. As soon as they figured out that from Peyton, they know if they really talked with him and actually got down to the bottom of things that they could resolidify his commitment. Yeah. And, and I mean, the second you got a stall out of him, it was, I, I wouldn't say uh, it's pretty over, you know, if the second you start to not think about it, 
and Oregon on the other hand, I imagine felt like they had it done. Um, but yeah, it just, just truly unreal recruiting job by both of those guys. Um, it's it, just stunning, just truly stunning. Yeah. Um, and it's just like that, that one signing, like I said earlier in this, in this podcast was so, you know, big for like the morale of the Sooner fan base. But even though, like, you know, whenever we didn't get a con and we didn't get Bowen the day before, uh, you know, the class, everyone's talking about this is still a great class. It's still a top 10. Absolutely. But we were saying that just to make ourselves feel better. Obviously, it's still a good class. We all know that. But we are very disappointed. We're disappointed in the class because we had higher expectations for what it could be. Obviously, whenever we were earlier in the season, whenever things had a little bit more light and we thought about Peyton Bowen, we thought – we had David Hicks in the back. We we're talking about top three classes and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, we were disappointed. We really were. Um, but now that he's back in, it's completely shifted the narrative of what Oklahoma is. Top five class right now, you know, number four on ESPN, number five on 247. Um, feels really good. And all it was was just one player. And that's all it took for us to shift. And obviously, right. everyone's going to want us to talk about David Hicks, Bobby. Like, everyone wants oh, yeah. to talk about David Hicks. Because just because we turned Peyton Bowen, why not could we turn David Hicks? But completely different situation. Am, am I wrong here? I don't think you're wrong. Um, because I, it totally different guy. You know, he obviously doesn't have the same ties to Oklahoma that uh, Bowen did, which I think that's easier to kind of play on the heartstrings, play on the connections, you know, mm -hmm. his connection with, um, you know, Jackson Arnold, uh, obviously his girlfriend is there. It's close to close to home. There's so much you can do off that. Yeah. Uh, and really with Hicks, all you have is kind of close to home. Um, but no, I, I do want to say one point on, you know, the mood and the attitude of everything is, you know, really it's just been damage control in yeah. the recruiting world ever since then. And like, maybe you get a bow and maybe you get a Hicks, maybe you add on to it, but um, it's hard to feel excited about, Oh yay, We didn't screw everything up. Like we didn't, we, we held everything together. That's not, that's not exactly the most uh, dopamine um, inducing thing. So getting mm -hmm. a big, big name like that, tacking onto that is, it, it feels great. And it's easy to kind of focus on Bowen. I, I mean, obviously we are, he's in the thumbnail. He's all that, but yeah, it is a class that is rich with talent. Um, you know, I, I, the craziest thing to me, this is our, the, uh, PJ Adebowale. That's OU's first defensive five star since Caleb Kelly. We have two in this class. That's unreal. It's ridiculous. And we've already talked about PJ ad nauseum in the past, but everyone loves, you know, the whole flash, you know, last second gets of Peyton Bowen holding on to PJ. Uh, unbelievable. So the, the seven foot plus wingspan coming off the edge, absolute monster of a man. If you watch any OU football, and that means you're listening to this podcast, you watched some OU football, you saw very quickly in every single game what minimal pass rush we had as an Oklahoma team. Absolutely miserable. No speed, no length. Quarterbacks could do whatever they want. We made Martinez look like a freaking Heisman for Kansas State, and he got benched later in the season for a team that was doing really well. That takes a lot for a quarterback to get benched for a winning team, and we made that guy look good because he could just go there and just pick us apart. Guys like P.J. changed the whole game. Who gets the big money in football? Peyton Bowen at safety, it's a great thing, but safeties don't get paid like pass rushers do. You think of like the money that, you know, the Bosa, like Nick Bosa is going to get in his next contract. It's going to be unbelievable. Obviously, his brother Joey Bosa got paid, was the one of the most expensive, you know, contracts in defensive NFL history. Pass rushers get paid. They change the game. You have to completely get, change your game scheme if – a guy's getting to the quarterback time and time again within a couple seconds. And PJ can be that type of guy. He's raw, but we could work with his work ethic and make him an exceptional player at OU and make him a force that everyone's going to have to scheme against. And that's, I mean, that's the thing is it's, it's like having a seven footer, like a Chet Holmgren that can shoot, but is also big. 
the reason why those players are so do not damn PJ into chat. Oh, no. oh, oh, oh. Okay. Like Kevin Durant, like Kevin Durant, you know, someone like Kevin Durant or Christoph Sprazingis. Why? You know, or, or Christoph Sprazingis. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> Let's just keep uh, throwing, throwing things here. Non, non-healthy tall players. <laughs> Gian- Giannis on, on a Decumpo. That's okay, better. We'll end on Giannis. Yeah, Giannis. Okay, this is we're we're getting out of hand here. No, 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 no. What what I'm essentially saying is the reason why they're so valuable is because they're physical uniform or unicorns. Mm-hmm. You can't yeah. coach players into being that. That's why people love, you know, the Bosa's love players like that because the physical ability. There aren't a lot of people out there like that, and mm-hmm. I think that's why a guy like Adebayo is so crucial. But um, I, I know, I like you said, we've talked about him a ton. Too. What's that? He's just a good kid too. He's got a strong work. I think that's what they say about him. And like, he just, he knows what he needs to do. And obviously with his commitment throughout all of the six and six season and the hectic nature we've had here and his rate, his rating going up and up and up and up. And obviously we saw him in on three, get super high in the player rankings. And you said, I'm sticking with Oklahoma. He, Ohio state was pushing him hard. And he said, all right, now I'm going to stick with Oklahoma. That's, that's a special kind of kid, and I'm really excited to see what he does in Norman. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's see what else can we talk about here. I, well, anything else on the Bowen back saga? Where we start about David Hicks because we didn't. Yeah, let's go back we, to we Hicks. Started back that, Hicks. but obviously we had some thoughts we need to finish because that's what everyone wants to know now. Like, do we have a shot at David Hicks? Obviously, um, he said that he was going to wait and do his signing on Friday, which would be tomorrow as we're recording this later Thursday night, and. I was kind of posing the question to you, Bobby, um, earlier. Is I it's it's this a similar situation to Peyton Bowen? Everyone wants to make parallels because these are two guys that were, you know, big time OU and we lost them at the last second. And now people are hearing we're putting full court press onto David Hicks. Do you think I mean I don't think that's any different than what we'd be doing to begin with? Of course we were doing a full court press on this. This is one of the best defensive linemen in the country that has IOU high on his list. Of course we're going to be doing that. I just think it's a different situation, so I don't want to put high expectations into Sooner fans because obviously that hopium that you're talking about, I think we're running a little high on that one, and I, I don't want people to overdose on it. I think that's fair because, uh, you know, I and and ultimately it doesn't matter if people are disappointed or not because Hicks would be, I mean, don't get me wrong, he, it, it's like he would be such a massive, like a massive coup for OU to get like, that would be an enormous mm-hmm. to get a guy like Hicks, uh, physical, unreal athlete, unreal defensive tackle, um, at a position that, I mean, an instant impact guy, honestly, um, probably potentially one of the best defensive tackles we've had since Gerald McCoy. Uh, so he like, that's the type of player we could be getting. Oh yeah. So if there's a way to flip him, if there's a way to pull him from the clutches, of uh texas a&m i mean it'd be massive um Mm -hmm. but you know and i and i'll say this there's no better um recruiting staff for you know d linemen than what ou has todd bates is i I guarantee you working those phones hard right now Mm -hmm. and david hicks loves bates we already know that like the whole reason that david hicks was considering oklahoma is he loves Bates. Obviously, Bates has put people into the league, and he's an extremely personable guy that gets along, and you know, families love him. And the thing is with David Hicks, you know, Peyton Bowen's a completely different situation. Like you said, Peyton Bowen had Oklahoma connections. You said it, and it was a perfect way to describe it. He had, you know, Jackson Arnold in his pocket. He saw him every single day in the hallways at school and after pra- and after school for practice in the weight room. Jackson Arnold was constantly talking to him, constantly texting. Um, David Hicks, you know, he doesn't have that. Um, Jack and Peyton Bowen has his girlfriend, you know, Oklahoma soccer. David Hicks doesn't. And, you know, Peyton Bowen was choosing between Eugene, Oregon, and South Bend, um, very far away from Denton. David Hicks is choosing between Texas A&M and Oklahoma. And he's out, you know, Katy, Texas, and Texas A&M's closer. So, it's it's a, it's a different ball game. We can't really use the proximity argument, the OU connection argument. Really, all we got to hope for here is, I hate to say it, and OU fans kind of think that we're kind of white knights about this, but you're going to have to negative recruit Texas A&M. You really will. Obviously, why would you want to go to a, a t- toxic culture or Jimbo? It seems like he's just stuck <laughs> there, and they don't want to buy his buyout because it's unbelievable, right? 
And you see all these wonderful five-star guys that go in there and they're just hitting the transfer portal right now. So we would love to have you, David Hicks, in our class. I think it'd be smarter for you to come to Oklahoma and save your time in the transfer portal and we see you as a sophomore instead. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's the thing is negative recruiting is the move here because you can you can sell them on, look, it was year one, it was bad, but at the same time, you know, we're starting from scratch defensively right now. Oh, on the other hand, Texas had a position either. Yeah, it's like you could start from day one. Like you could get like you, you, this is all you, man. You can anchor this defense on the D uh, on the D line, and it's like um, not only that, but like Texas A and M. On the other hand, Jimbo's been building this for what four years now, five mm-hmm. years. Yeah, and they they missed a bowl. They they have been as down bad as they've they've really been in recent memory. So for me, like in year four or five of that project, you have to be kind of panicked about this. Oh, um, OU, on the other hand, I, I I think you chalk it up as a bad year and then you move on because um, and, and just hope that you can start winning football games. But the thing is, you know, we, I don't think Jimbo can preach, can give the, you know, give us time, uh, you know, uh, spiel and sermon because it just he has had time. He has no more excuses, zero more. Like there's nothing left for him excuses wise. Obviously you just got to sell talent and you got to sell money um, down in college station. And obviously talent, when you get a bunch of talented kids around each other, these guys have been going to camps. They go into, you know, the, those seven on seven camps and Lee elevens and stuff like that. And whenever they get super teams, obviously they think like, Oh, this is like the, I hate to make another NBA reference on a college football podcast, but (laughs) I can get all my buddies and take my talents down to South Beach and win a championship. Football isn't basketball. You can't go take just a couple, you know, talented, you know, get four or five, six, five stars and just get a team and think you can win. It's just not that. Like football is an 11 man game. Um, And then it's, you know, 22 offense defense. You can't just go down with a couple of star players and hope they pan out and you have a superstar team. Obviously, you're going to have game changers that change the game at the quarterback position, but that's a different talk. But Texas A&M hasn't been getting those kind of guys at quarterback yeah. and all the other skill positions. So yeah. he doesn't have that excuse anymore to say, you know, hey, uh, this was a bad year, but we'll be better next year. And the culture, the culture right now is we heard all these rumors about the locker room and sus- we already know there were suspensions of some of the younger guys. And I don't know how much I'm going to buy, like we getting smoked in the locker room and you know, all these kinds of weird things like people not having respect for the coaching staff. It just seems just fishy. Like, I like I don't know if I'd want to dip my toes in that pool. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. And like like you said, it just it feels it feels off overall. And, uh, you know, look, that undated national championship uh, plaque that they gave Jimbo when he when he was hired, it's getting a little dusty right now. Absolutely it's getting more. dusty. <laughs> what do they do with it if they get rid of him? Like, do they just kind of, like, I don't know, throw it in an incinerator or something? Put, put, it, on, they... put it on the curb like Jimbo put his Christmas tree whenever he was uh, at <laughs> Florida State. Someone, exactly. someone will pick it up. <laughs> Exactly. Someone will pick it up on the way out. I love it. <laughs> Does he get to keep it? <laughs> Put it Honestly, on his mantle? I, I don't even know what you even do with that kind of thing because it's such a disappointment, but you can can you throw that in the trash? I don't you just know. just don't I, have I, it in the first place. I, you just... got to just throw that in your basement and just never yeah. look at it. If it's... You, you know, but I don't know. Even if I had horrible, horrible time there, I, I don't know if I could throw something away like that. That's just it's... ridiculous. It's too ridiculous. <laughs> I kind of want to buy it. We should we should pull it together and try to pull some money together and try to buy the the fake Jimbo Fisher natty. Um, oh my god, Tex A and M's too expensive for us. I don't know if we got it. We true. need we need more subscribers on YouTube if we if we're gonna start getting some of that money to buy our Jimbo uh, Jimbo <laughs> fake national. Start a GoFundMe to buy Jimbo's fake natty. I love it. <laughs> uh, oh man. Anyways, let's. Okay, so we've talked about Hicks. Um, how big that would be. We'll see how that goes. Uh, obviously, we'll probably hear some news on Friday. Uh, but going forward with this class, um, what do you think OU can and will do uh, for f- official National Signing Day um, in terms of the portal, in terms of uh, prep kids? Uh, what's on the horizon for OU going forward? Oh, there is. I think there's so much more to go into the portal. I think Brent Venable said it. Like, we've got 
plenty more in the portal. And we saw it today, obviously, um, getting Reggie Pearson from Texas Tech. Um, kind of funny how he is posting his highlights of him just kind of dominating us and, you know, hitting Dylan Gabriel. Hitting Gabriel. That was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> um, you know, having another defensive back, you know, in a room where it's – on especially like safety cornerbacks a little bit thin in terms of depth having a guy who's got one year left of eligibility he's been there done that you know went to wisconsin before he went to texas tech he's got many you know snaps under his belt i mean think of this like a cj colden trey morrison kind of get you know some guy that you know he's great for depth great for leadership and man did trey morrison really and cj colden kind of really help us there at the end of the season So he'll be competing. He'll be competing for those starting jobs. Um, And I'm curious to see if we get more similar guys like that. The thing is with the portal, not all portal is like, you know, getting these superstars that are going to change, you know, the team of Oklahoma forever. But man, does it help with depth? Because you need these kind of guys with experiences who have strong work ethics that fit our culture that can kind of plug in and, you know, play that last year and, come in if say someone one of our young guns that you know you know a billy bowman gets injured again we can move tra- um you know we can move reggie pearson out there to safety or cornerback or wherever our defensive backs need him uh it's, it's going to, we're going to continue to have more and there's i would not be surprised if we hear some other transfer news in the coming days too for sure. And I, I, by the way, uh, if you've been following the podcast uh, closely enough, everyone, uh, you know, we've kind of been on a little mini hiatus since the uh, Texas Tech game. Uh, we haven't talked about Desan McCullough yet. The McCullough brothers committing, oh Jameson. God. What a, what a win that was. No one talks about it. I, I don't know why. Like, like, that is such a big deal. It really is. Like, you know, getting a four-star safety – um, is one thing in this class, but Desan McCullough is an absolute monster of a man. This was a high end four star coming out of high school. Goes to Indiana, so people are like, "Oh man, I don't know how much you know." Getting an Indiana transfer, this guy is just straight out of Bloomington. You know, he decided to stay home, and he was the number seventy five player in the nation, and that was a huge get for Indiana. But this guy's got talent. And another edge rusher, like I told you, I think edge rusher was one of the most important things that we need to fix Absolutely. this offseason right next to inside linebacker. And getting a guy like McCullough, uh, man, is so, so helpful. I, I Honestly, everyone's been looking at you know the t- class of 2023 right now, but more people need to be talking about this kind of guy that we got into this class. Yeah, I mean, McCullough was Indiana's highest uh, rated recruit ever, ever across the board, which is unreal. And not just was he not, was he only, you know, touted, you know, coming out of high school, but uh, his performance at Indiana with the Hoosiers this year was incredible. He, he I believe got uh, honorable mention, all big 10. Um, he was excellent for the Hoosiers. And he just, he just fits. He fills a need right yeah. away. And I, I, I think having a guy who doesn't have to have that, you know, transition between high school to, you know, college. We always say that's a big deal with, you know, Juco guys to get a guy like that from a power five conference is really, really special. Oh yeah. It's like at a position of need, like I was saying earlier, you just don't get many game changers in term in terms of the portal. And this is the type of guy that can be that. Uh, if you're looking at, if you go to two, four, seven and you look at like, Oh, how good are these um, transfers? You know, he's, Top 10, he's a number 11 on 247 in terms of ranking uh, transfers. And that's including guys like, you know, Travis Hunter. That Do I even count him in the transfer portal? It's, no, he's just, <laughs> he's he's never part of Jackson State. He's you know, primetime university is what he was. Yeah, like, you. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, like, there's so many really good, like, you know, Grayson Call still on the portal, you know. Uh, Hudson Card is number 10 right now over. Oh, man, court. jeez. Okay. I, people are really hyping up Hudson Card. How the hell is Hudson Card over Spencer Sanders? Okay, that's another that's another time. No, I don't I don't know yeah. if I want to talk about that too much. But like, I want the thirty year old North Texas quarterback. quarterback. Well, we can't always get what we want, but you know, I guess we do have an opening a backup quarterback, Bobby. I don't he know. Be, he could be Davis Bevel, but old. I love him. I don't know what. Can you explain to me what would go into a thirty-year-old man coming back for to be a backup quarterback? I can't. 
can't even imagine. Like, like we, I, I mean, like, can you imagine right now? We're like 27. So yeah, <laughs> going back and playing, you know, a sport right now, but plus five years from now, Bobby, like you, you oh. can't go into a backup role. If you're going to do it big, you got to do it big. God, could you imagine doing like the university college courses, you know, like a uh, intro to what was, was it gateway? called? Intro to being be like, it was basically just like intro to being in college. That was uh, gateway, the right? easiest that what it was gateway, gateway. Yeah. This, this man is just going to come in and take gateway, <laughs> like two I, semesters yeah, of gateway. I can't even imagine. What <laughs> How do you do fellow life? children? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's just ridiculous. But like the portal is going to continue to get more fun for OU. There's going to be more guys. Um, I think the biggest one that we really have to look at, you know, coming that obviously a lot of people are talking about is that wide receiver, uh, Trey Harris from Louisiana Tech, obviously a guy who put up high production. You know, a lot of people are trying to go after him. And, you know, I, I think that losing Theo Weiss gives us a spot for that. Um, we still don't know what Marvin Mims is going to do. So, you know, Marvin Mims goes. I st- I think you know getting wide receivers you know giving getting a couple more was it would be really smart. I think Harris is just kind of doing his due diligence, but it seems like he's been a like a strong OU lean for a while now, and I'm just kind of waiting until I see his edit on Twitter until he's an OU commit. Yeah, no, it's that's true, and and I think I think National Signing Day, you know, having all the dust settle from that, you know, helps. You know, I I think. And here's the thing. There's still, I think, a lot of people who are going to portal after bowl, see what's oh, going yes. on. The landscape is always changing. And I guarantee you, OU knows people that are thinking about in the portal or people that they just like that they know that are in kind of like in kind of eh situations. They really didn't do everything they wanted to um, at their school. And OU is probably talking in back channels to a lot of people. Transfer portal, especially with high profile guys, it's not they hit the portal and it's like, okay. You know, it's the floodgates are open, you know, and you get 30,000 text messages from coaches around the nation. It's probably what's going on is like, you know, OU sees a guy they like, and I'm sure a lot of other big time colleges are doing it. And they text them through some kind of back channel. And they're like, hey, like, I understand you've had a tough year, but let me tell you something. We have open slots at Oklahoma, a wide receiver, you know, Drake Stoops, Marvin Mims are question marks right now. We just lost CO East, you know. Jalo Farouk's getting run a running back right now in practice for the bowl game. Oh, so I mean, like, I mean, like, I'm, you know, we've got slots at wide receiver. If you want to come in and produce, like, come, we've got it for you. And um, we just got one of the best quarterbacks in the nation um, coming in as a true freshman. Plus, you know, we got a Dylan Gabriel has been there and done that, and he put up really efficient numbers. Obviously, they're going to spin out. I'm not going to talk about Dylan Gabriel and if he's good or not. Uh, Q tie on next podcast if you really want to dive into that kind of stuff. <laughs> but like Dylan Gabriel has put up some numbers, and Jeff Levy has been proven to make wide receivers look good. So, I mean, I would understand why some, you know, people that are freshmen right now, college that really didn't like how they get um, respected and their new program, wouldn't think about hitting the portal after a couple um, little pokes from OU in the back channels. Do you think there's any genuine concern about Dylan Gabriel leaving? Because he's been non-committal yeah. about next year, um, about his future. Is that is that something on your on your radar? Is something that could happen? Because I don't, no, I'm not it buying just, it. Really, it just does not make any sense to me why he'd leave. I mean, it's either he's retiring from football or he's going to the NFL. And in today's, you know, in IL days, we've seen guys like Bo Nix come back. We've seen guys like, you know, Jane Daniels come back. Like these people are realizing at a very big program, like an Oregon, like an LSU, like an Oklahoma as a quarterback, I may make more money being the quarterback for Oklahoma than I'm making, you know, if I made it on even a practice squad, like I don't even know if I feel confident to tell you that Dylan Gabriel would get drafted in this draft. I just don't see any kind of scenario where he leaves. And do you think he's going to transfer again? What what other better situation could he be with his guy and Jeff Levy? Obviously, he might feel a little bit of the pressure. He saw what happened to Spencer Rattler whenever he kind of had an iffy season the time before. 
and the t- fans, I'm sure, guarantee you, um, he's listened a couple times to what the fans have had to say about him and their high expectations for quarterbacks. And he knows like there might be some Jackson Arnold chance next year. It might be not the, you know, the cleanest and easiest road, but if you're a person at the quarterback position that calls himself a leader and you are doubting your ability to do well enough to where the fans won't revolt against you, you're already stuck to begin with. He's got to be more confident than that. So I'd like to think he's not thinking those things and thinks I can do good enough to where I can make sure the fans don't chant. We want Caleb. We want, you know, Jackson <laughs> chance. We want anymore. Jackson. I know it doesn't sound oh, cool. Um, but it would, it would have to be a, it would have to be a more fun to chant against. It have to be a Jackson Arnold that <laughs> that works. Don't but, start it, Bobby. Don't, oh no, don't no, 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 <laughs> no. Someone's but gonna I, clip. I, someone's gonna clip that and be like, Oklahoma fan <laughs> calls for Jackson Arnold to start. Oh god! Uh, um, but no, but let me tell you something, Bobby. That take is not hot because there are so many. Oh, I know it's not. Know, like, I just bring in Jackson Arnold. He's a competitor, but you know, I, I think that he's already came out and said, "I'm really excited to work under." the possibility or something to work under a guy like Dylan Gabriel, Dylan Gabriel's reacted on Twitter to almost like every single recruit that we've gotten yeah. and transfer portal we gotten. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know if this is some strong arm through NIL to get money through the, you know, the retaining your players kind of thing. It, that, that's my only guess. There's no way he's leaving. Just thinking logistically Great. about the situation. I just don't, he would be extremely stupid to leave. He retweeted the video of him getting blown up. Like he's yeah. okay with that. Like he's fine he, with it. You know, so in he is so yeah, in. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I think he's just playing the game and obviously giving us a little bit of you know nuggets here and there to make sure everyone knows he's still committed. It's not like he he's one of these players that goes to their Instagram, deletes all of the photos, no. and changes their bio just to kind of get an extra couple million dollars. You know, I, he's not doing that. I just think that. He's taking you the know, Xavier Worthy. Time. Yeah, and there's Xavier Worthy. Yeah. Like, I don't know what he's doing. Obviously, we thought he was a fine <laughs> steal delivered to USC, but who knows? Te- Texas dropped the bag. But yeah, by the, way, by the way, by the way, I wanted to say, uh, I saw we have a bump, uh, some solid people on stream right now. We we talked about uh, Peyton Bowen a little bit earlier. Uh, if y'all have any questions, feel free to fire them off. We'd love to you know, talk mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. We're just kind of doing the overall podcast at the moment, just talking about the roster, the future, etc. cetera. Uh, mm-hmm. So just, just to let you know, we're not, we're not catfishing you with a Peyton Bowen uh headline i <laughs> we promise you we talk- in. you're listening <laughs> now sorry guys you're gonna have to like, talk with dylan gabriel about another 10 minutes <laughs> so let's talk about the future of uh of uh general booty let's let's oh, uh, God, do you think he can go. do you think he can move up to the third string quarterback spot <laughs> no i uh, what what quarterback are we gonna make nick evers nowadays yeah no oh, let's God. let's please i completely agree move on away from the quarterback position and just like other just transfer portal stuff, I, I think I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, other positions that we look at is offensive line. Obviously, we're having some overturn, you know, and at a very important position of left tackle. Right now, behind it, you're thinking at Jacob Sexton as the backup. And to be completely honest with you, obviously, the coaching staff thinks very highly of Jacob Sexton and Jake Taylor as well. And as these young guys coming through, but we kind of would rather have a veteran at left tackle. Uh, I understand Dylan Gabriel is a lefty, so that left tackle isn't as important as your standard right-handed quarterback, but still left tackle should be super dominant. And whenever Anton Harrison had good games, like that is whenever we played really well, our offensive line would dominate. Um, So I wouldn't like, we are probably heavily looking into the transfer portal right now at offensive linemen and you know it might be as similar to a McKay Matire situation where we get a guy and he's a plug and play and he plays a year and lets these younger guys like Sexton get a little bit more work in the beat and bow system and where he can come in as two years under his belt and be ready to play yeah no I I think that is kind of how it's going to be for a while you know um and uh, I, I think that's just kind of the nature of how the portal's been um and you know it's it's just kind of the nature of how we've built O lines uh, in the past couple of years. It feels like we've had ever. I mean, ever since the Joe Moore uh, award winning team that we had in 2018, it's like we have one guy who's really good. The rest are kind of okay. 
the other guy, the, the guy that's good leaves and then someone else becomes really good. And then the rest overall aren't that great. And it, it's, it's kind of frustrating that we haven't had a cohesive unit in a while. So, um, you know, maybe the portal can solve that. I don't really know. It's just, it, it, it's kind of been a bit, a bit, a bit hidden miss recently. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, see a couple people talking about like, they'd be okay. Yeah. James thrice in the chat saying like, they'd be okay with Jacob Sexton. Obviously they're very happy with Jacob Sexton. We saw that young people can play that left tackle position. Anton Harrison did it and they were blown away by him. But at the same time, you know, that's not the standard. And I guarantee you they're making sure, like, can we find other tackles to get kind of a little bit more veteranship at that position? Because to be honest with you, you know, if you have a guy who's a sophomore playing that position and he goes down as offensive linemen do, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, I just went down with my young guy, and now who do I got to look at behind that? Yeah. I saw on Twitter today Michael Tarquin, um, Mike Tarquin get into the portal um, he was a guy who committed to Florida, but that Bill, Bill Beatonbow targeted throughout his recruiting cycle and really liked. I'm sure that they're talking right now. Um, Bill Beatonbow makes great relationships with offensive linemen, and he sees guys, and he does not care about what their star rating is. He says, I really like you, and he goes in, and he goes all in on these guys. And a lot of the times we end up being second place. Um, but now, whenever you're second place in the transfer portal day and era, it's great because I guarantee you they still know Bill and Bebo is one of the better offensive linemen coach in the country. And it's a great place to come right back in and reestablish that relationship and um, come in for a chance to compete at a position of need right now for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, it, it to me, both, both ends of, you know, both lines are, are 100% number one, the, most crucial point to figure mm -hmm. out um, and it sucks because it's so hard to get you know big guys yeah. in the portal because they're just you know, people hold on to those guys it's just tough to find people that have a lot of great production under their belt um but are ready to go play for another team yeah i mean especially at this level uh when you're trying to make college football playoff runs when you're trying to be elite you know they, they just don't leave they 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 go to big places and they stay there and that's just that's just kind of how it is. Um, um, and it's it, it's frustrating. It's unfortunate. But, you know, that's like you, like I've said, that's just kind of kind of how it goes with, with mm -hmm. that. But um, what 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 are you thinking about the portal, though, in terms of uh, defensive line play? Any any particular names you see? I know it's like like we mm -hmm. said, it's a bit of you have to dig through the crumbs a bit. But uh, yeah. I don't know. I think the defensive line's a little bit dry right now. I, I'm I'm hoping that it's kind of a waiting game to after the bowls, like you said. Um, I haven't heard really. I haven't read anything on the message board so far of like names to watch in defensive line as of recently. Obviously, people are going to bring up, oh yeah, we got you know Jacob Lacey, and he's a great player, highly rated Notre Dame guy. I wouldn't buy too much into Jacob Lacey being this guy that is going to be this game breaker for us. He's just going to be another depth piece who's got some speed and some athleticism and um, will be there amongst the other defensive linemen that we have. I don't think he's going to be this game changer. His star rating in high school is not what he did at Notre Dame. He had trouble even cracking the rotation. Um, so even though he's got a lot of tools, he's got talent in his past, it's not like he's the same guy coming out of high school, um, but still a good get because you just don't get guys with that like history of talent through the portal. Like I said, it's extremely hard to find those kind of guys. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of something you need to develop organically, which is it's tricky when you're you know kind of going from scratch, um, because that was not exactly uh, something that uh, Alex Grinch really prioritized in the past. And you know, in the, in the comments we have uh, you know we have David uh, Rich over here uh, talking about you know the, the the push to flip David Hicks that we kind of brought up earlier. Um, and, you know, we, we answered it a little earlier in the podcast and, you know, I know momentum and all that. So, um, you know, makes sense that we, you know, you might not have seen that, but um, no, like that's the, that's why getting a guy like Hicks is so important because you have to home grow that sort of thing. You can't mm -hmm. just portal it in. It's not like a wide receiver or, um, or, you know, it, it just, not you just can't plug and play it. Yeah. You, you can't Jordan Addison, Xavier worthy this or that you just put in the wide receiver. Like like you said, these really high-end defensive line difference makers that go out and become stars, they come in, they get run as a true freshman, 
already because they're so talented. And they go, dang, I'm starting as a sophomore. Sophomore, everyone realizes, and they go, next year's draft is going to be fun whenever he's there. Then his junior year, he goes off. There is no room for transfer portal talk during then. Um, you know, what you got to hope, really, as defensive line targets is guys from lesser schools. But the thing is, you know, people that are, you know, from, you know, a non-Power 5 school probably don't have the size and athletic features um, because they probably would have gone to a Power 5 if they were six foot four and has got an extremely large frame and has got speed even though that they're big. People take those kind of guys, even if they're not football talented, as these big schools because they know that they're projects. And the projects that pan out, by the time they panned out, they're bowl out. I mean, they're draft eligible and they're probably gone. Yep. yep. Like the Ronnie Parkins type players, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, so. like, you know, people with that kind of frame, if they are not at a, you know, power five school, it's just they're, you know, like they don't have enough time to develop. Uh, I mean, they're de- already developed by the time they're good. They're off to the draft. Uh, it's just, there's not a Khalil Mack situation where we can go get Khalil Mack from Buffalo, for example, <laughs> and transfer portal him over here. Khalil Mack was a late bloomer, but by the time he was a late bloomer, he was draft eligible and he fired up the draft rankings. And if you recall, like this dude, like, you know, was, he goes to the combine people knew of him a little bit of Buffalo, but he just tested off the, the record and just looked so good. And then what do you know? He ended up being one of the best defensive ends in football after that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, that's the thing is you can't find a diamond in the rough in this position. You're either a diamond or you're just kind of okay. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it, it's one of those things that's clearly evident in high school and clearly evident from prep. And it's all about yeah. size of these big guys. It's really what the equ- equation Absolutely. is. You know, we can get Louisiana Tech wide receivers because, you know, I don't care if you're 5'11". If you got good hands, you got speed, and you can get open, that's it. Um, it doesn't matter how tall you are and every all that kind of stuff and how much you weigh like these big boys. So it's just we'll continue to have struggles with this defensive line. And why it sucks, you know, that we didn't end up getting David Hicks in this class. You know, and you're like, man, that's a guy that completely could shift what we are because it's one of the hardest, you know, positions to have. Um, but we got to continue to stay optimistic and look at the class at hand. People don't talk enough about Derek LeBlanc. When yeah, we got yeah. him, you know, we were like, wow, this is a high in Florida defensive line commit. And we didn't really hear much from him after that. He just committed and he stayed quiet and he stayed in, you know, like this is a special kind of defensive line commit that can be a difference maker, but people don't want to talk about him as much because whenever you talk about defensive line, you're either talking about the defensive ends with PJ and obviously he's a really sexy person to talk about. Okay. That was not the right word for that in terms of, in terms of not, okay, goodness gracious. I need to write that back. I'm not talking about his work. <laughs> I'm just talking about like, he's got, he's a fun person to talk about because he's got, you know, like a wingspan. God, that was brutal. Jameson. Um, but, uh, but like he's, you know, talking about Derek LeBlanc is not the most fun because, you know, we're, we're talking about David Hicks if we're talking about interior. I mean, it's been the talk, these pipe dreams, this hope, this hopium. Um, let's give Derek LeBlanc his time in the sun. Like, that is a huge get at a position of need. Uh, this type of guys that, you know, high star ratings that have the physical attributes and athleticism that Oklahoma has struggled getting. You know, like, the last time I think we, like, we get similar interior guys – you know, like Michael Thompson, OUDNA, like switches off to offensive line, you know, like it's hard to get these kind of guys in our class. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but in the geographic, the, in the geographic footprint that we got LeBron block in Florida, you know, with the Gators uh, strongly going after him, you know, to go in, get a guy like that. And I know he has OU ties, so it's a little different, but mm-hmm. um, that's a big win. And I think that's the thing that's kind of tricky with recruiting at times is, when we got LeBlanc, that was a massive win. We were all excited, but mm-hmm. you know nothing happened on it, which is good. You don't want to hear bad news about commits. Um, and then signing day hits, you get the little video, and you're like, oh, yeah, whatever. But it doesn't mean that signing wasn't any less impactful than um, a guy you might have gotten out of, you know, who maybe is rated around the same, who is uh, a surprise. You know, the, the surprise factor doesn't make them any more valuable. Uh, and I think that is something that, you know, we really should appreciate a guy like LeBlanc because he is 
he's he is going to be a very big piece in a couple years yes for sure. yes and a huge position of need and another thing i want to give like you know his time this son too which which kind of sucks because whenever he committed everyone was crying about peyton bowen and marcus strong if you can't get the david hicks of the world these soup like the absolute freaks at these positions like with great measurables and they're they've got so much athleticism but got such a good frame to them you go and take a guy that has that frame and has that athleticism but still needs to develop some more and that's marcus strong like another florida guy but six foot three 265 pounds like and with that frame he's the type of guy where it's like i've already got a couple of defensive linemen in the boat but if I want to take a runner on some guy, let's see if we can develop him into something. That's kind of what we did with Tyler Guyton in the last portal class last year. This was a guy that was huge. He was big. He's athletic, converted, tied in. Man, does he have tools. If we can get him within our system, you know, get Schmitty on him, and, you know, let Bill Beatenbo, um kind of teach him a little bit, this guy could be good. And now it's like, that's a great right tackle option for the future. Whenever he played in games, he showed some things. You know, if you get a kind of guy with the frame that Mark Strong has, you know, you never know what could happen with these kind of guys. He could develop and get better and better. And with a teacher like Todd Bates, you know, that's worth that shot. It's better than getting, you know, a six foot, 290 pound guy that his ceiling's quite about there. He'll be a gap stopper. Um, but he's going to be higher rated than Marcus Strong. I'd rather take a swing for the fences if this is a guy that's kind of rounding out your class. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think there is such a, you know, an emphasis on four and five stars, which is important. You know, just looking at 247, Marcus Strong is a three star uh, rated about 85, which is, here's the thing, that's still pretty solid. That is a base of something to build off. It'd be of. amazing um, for Oklahoma state. Okay. Sorry. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, if you're Oklahoma state, you're losing your mind. If you get this guy, Number for, nine for real. 12, but I'm not going to get, let's not talk. about <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't, we don't need to talk about OSU. We, we there. Yeah. Uh, but my thing is, you know, like, like you said, the measurables, uh, six foot three, uh, 265 pounds. Um, this is a guy that, can be a guy, you know, he might not have an in, instant impact, but give him some time, let him work, let the coaches do what they do, which is coach. And you never mm -hmm. know. Um, I, I think that's something to be excited about still. Like that is, you know, you can't just, we're not Alabama. Hopefully one day, maybe we have the ability to sign Alabama level classes, but getting a guy like this as a, a, a bit of a stocking stuffer in a way that, that that's, that's nice stuff. That's good stuff. And in Florida, another another big win in yes, Florida. Yes, exactly. And yes, I agree. I should have not put little brother into the conversation. That was really mean. I'm very, very sorry. I That was uncalled for. I don't know. I was, <laughs> feeling, I was feeling kind of dangerous. I've been feeling pretty cheesy the past couple mornings. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, was, so it, it, anyone who follows our uh, Twitter account knows that you, I'm we, so we, you mad have been feeling miss cheesy. I you missed a day? day? Not, yes, I missed a day. I've been oh. so busy recently. And just one, like, there was a couple of days where I've been posting my, like, evening updates. Yeah, man, I, I, I've been waking up cheesy, I promise, guys. I've, I, I've been better. I've, I, I've legitimately, I every single day I wake up, I have a notification on my phone that tells me, um, feeling cheesy, question mark. And I let <laughs> Twitter know if I'm feeling the cheesiest this morning. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I'll be waking up feeling pretty cheesy, but I, I need to sleep in tomorrow. I, I need some extra sleep. But, you know... Uh, I don't even. What we're, we're we're talking about apologizing to little brother before that. Oh, you, yeah. We're talking about oh, Mark God. Strong and it. I'm in like the measurables and everything. Let's kind of relate it to like I know a lot of people here probably play fantasy football. Um, whenever I am drafting my fantasy football teams, obviously you take solid like solid guys at the top of the draft that you know they're going to give you a really good product. But once you get to the point where you're drafting your bench players, like. Do you want to draft a guy that you know is going to get three catches and 33 yards and that's about it? So he's going to give you just very little points every single week. Or are you going to take a guy that could absolutely go off? He could get, you know, you know, zero points the whole season, barely any play, but maybe he has kind of potential to go off and be a special kind of guy. You take those guys at the end of your draft, at the end of the class. You know, whenever you have a couple extra spots that you thought were going to be full with other players, but now they're open. Take big hacks 
in today's day in the transfer portal, you know, you kind of got to do that because mediocre players that are too deep and three deep, not a lot of them stick with their team anymore and stick it out, you know, four or five years at Oklahoma or in their college. You know, we saw so many of these guys at OU right now that are, you know, two, three deep and they're in the portal right now because they want to go and be starters. So it's nice to have depth, but picking a guy that, you know, that doesn't really have the ceiling to be more than a depth piece, it's just not really smart for the long term of a class. Yeah, because in the past, maybe that works, but this is a totally different ball game. You know, people, guys want to play. And if it's like, hey, maybe by your junior year, you might get some burn. I don't think that's good enough for, you know, as college kids, you you know, you want to play, you want instant results, all yeah. of that sort of for thing. And when you're not getting any burn and you can go over to wherever, at, especially at Oklahoma, you're mm-hmm. at the top of the top, go down a little bit, you, you go, go find another solid power five spot. And you have everyone in your ear saying you can play there and they'll pay you a little bit to go there. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to do that. And that's totally fair. I think that's, I think that's a, that's overall a good thing, but you have to kind of, adjust things uh going forward in terms of managing depth understanding who you got and understanding that that um that turnover is going to be way higher just because it's a new ball game mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think of like you know a similar thing but from a different position uh we got Braden willis at the very end of his recruiting cycle this guy was a wide receiver had he had a good frame to him but he was still skinny didn't have a lot of muscle on him but hey this is a swing. This is a guy that maybe we could develop into a guy, put some muscle on him. And, or could he be a big body, like outside wide receiver? Like we did a lot with Mark Andrews, or could he get big enough and be a contributor and, you know, play close and with his hand in the dirt and look what happened with him. Braden Willis is one of the more big impact players for us this season. And he was a last second kind of get in the recruiting cycle. So taking those kind of swings of guys that you can develop and put them into something and they can actually be very big impact players. I think it's the way to go. So if people are upset, like, Oh, we got this guy. He's like, he, he only got like an 85, you know, on two, four, seven, three star. And it's not, you know, the big pick that everyone likes to, you know, you know, get really excited about. I love it. I think, I think I love these kind of things go for upside. I want to make a Poku analogy so bad and I'm not going to do it yeah, because I already we were just making all these kind of, I, I've talked about NFL. We, do, we talked about NBA. Oh we didn't God. use F1 references this time. So that's oh, good. Well, that's a plus. Yes, that, that's good. Dude, that's also you, good. Have, I, have, I don't know if you've been watching the weekend spreads or not, but at, at one point we started talking about the musical Oklahoma and that that got off the rails. So like it, we've been I've, I've been tightening it up, tightening, tightening it up. We've been doing a better job here. What has happened since I've gone? Oh, my I, man. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know. Man. Talking about musicals. Uh, yeah, no. And, and, and in retrospect, the guy who said we're not. Uh, we, we don't see like sports guys. I, I was offended by the comment and then I remembered that half that video was us talking about a musical. So that's a fair <laughs> point. I apologize. I mean, uh, to, to be the honest who... with you, we don't really look like athletes, you know, whenever no. you look at us either because we're all, all of us here on the podcast are under six foot, correct? And it's not like we have any muscles that Ty, you can see. Time might be, time might be like, edging it like maybe a five yeah. eleven, six foot flat i don't know I, I i don't really judge people's heights too well <laughs> but definitely you you're like you're like a five ten. i you're not tall enough where you can fake it sadly jameson uh uh-huh, no i'm in the sub six foot sad boy club i'll go out and say that. that's okay i'll give myself yeah, I, a half on the five ten and a half though and on my life I'm gonna... on myself five eleven. but i'm not i'm not a horrible <laughs> person to go all the way up to six foot that's i'm not some guy who's filling out the depth chart on the football team and i'm like actually you know i'm actually six foot yeah no i i'm out here trying to like scrape and maybe pretend that i'm like five eight <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 a true five seven but i'm like but Bobby, oh, you were five, five like seven five six whenever you were in fourth grade and that's all that matters i hey i got a hell of an athletic career in, in middle school. It was not great. everyone can say that. 52 people are watching me talk about my middle school athletic <laughs> career. I'm Nothing sorry. Hey, if y'all, if y'all are listening right now, y'all want to listen about the Peyton Bowen talk and David Hicks, just go yes. ahead, rewind that video and just yeah. listen to it from the beginning. 
Um, we would love to, for you to continue to watching our videos. We're putting out content. We're talking about the bowls uh, every single week, um, giving our inside information on that. So if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to that. If you want yes. like an Oklahoma's kind of viewpoint from play- from people that aren't former players or aren't, you know, experts that are boots on the ground all the time. We're just younger guys that, you know, like to just mess around, have a good time, but also kind of talk from a fan perspective, which I feel like you don't really get to see much in OU podcast games. So go ahead and subscribe if you like this kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah, we just uh, we're just like your friends that like to just kind of, you know, talk around. You know, we we you know, we're not exactly, uh, you know, we're not journalists, obviously. Uh, We just uh, (laughs) really love the suitors and we like to like kind of hang out and talk about the talk about everything so you know we yeah. we don't pretend to know more than y'all uh but you know we sure sure do love the hell out of ou football and we love talking about it um mm-hmm. uh, love engaging with y'all as well so this is uh this was a good time uh as always we look forward to uh looking forward to talking about the cheese and bowl but um oh yeah this, so this oh wrong uh banner oh, I no, give, give oh, no. we're fine we're fine Okay, so the cheese at bowl, by the way, we'll, we'll talk about that, that in the coming coming days. But um, if you want to hear more about Peyton Bowen, we did a really good segment on this. This live stream is about to end. Uh, if you're watching live on YouTube, um, just wait a little bit, reload it, and it should process. You can go right to zero and uh, listen to us talk about Bowen. We go in depth. It's great. So, um, yeah. Awesome. And look, if you like, if you, if you're more of a, like, Oh, I like listening to this on the podcast. Uh, you know, I don't want to watch these idiots talk the entire time. We have a people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If you don't want to, if you don't want to watch our smug faces do this, uh, you can, you can check us out wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple podcast, Stitcher, all of them, probably some I've never even heard of. That's, that's how, how widely we're distributed. So make sure to check that out if you like that as well. But um, James said, I think we're done promoting ourselves. Anything you want to say before we uh, head out of here? No, I'm happy as a clam right now. It, things are just looking good. I'm so happy that the OU fan base is not going to be moaning and uh, I, I don't want to cuss. Down bad. They're moaning and being very upset on Twitter. I'm glad that the mood has changed. Yeah, no, I, I think CBS Sports might have had us as a loser of signing day. Uh, not true. <laughs> not true. That's so stupid because this is he's, a really good class. Lincoln like Riley never got a top five class. He's never like got a top CBS five class. And Yahoo and ESPN need to stop talking about recruiting. Leave it to the recruitment side. ESP, right? ESPN's recruiting rankings are really bad, even though they benefited us. Uh, they put us at like they put us at four before uh, Bowen, which is really. Just really dumb. I feel the, ESPN's just ridiculous recruitment site. Well, the way they rank it, it's it's like, oh, how many ESPN top one hundreds do you have? We'll just do it by account. Like that's not that's not how that works. No, they're they're a uh, laughing stock in the community, and everyone knows it. Of course, yeah, they're they're really bad. They're really bad. But anyways, all right, folks, that has been our episode. Thank you all so much for watching, and uh, hope you all have a great holiday season. We'll see you soon. Because next time, we're about to feel some... We're about to feel pretty cheesy. Oh, man. Oh, I'm goodness. so excited. The game's going to suck, but it's going to be fun talking about the cheesy <laughs> ones. So, anyways. Do we right, for me, <laughs> oh, God. For me, Jameson, this has been Scooter Pod. We'll see you all next time. Boomer Sooner. Stay cheesy, folks. <laughs>